and the discussion about this particular project was way back in 1989 along the river of Thames. So that's how it all started. So, uh, but I must say that uh, his vision, which at that point of time in 89 when he talked to me, I thought was impossible because I had just passed out and uh, he had maybe around six or seven years ahead of me. But we knew the Indian system, how it worked, and how things were in the medical system of India. So what he thought and what he told me, I thought this man is absolutely gone bonkers, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Because he's a very good surgeon, we knew that. But as a man with a vision, no, I didn't give him many marks at that point of time. I must confess that. <coughs> but as we grew along, and I think as things evolved, yes, I mean, today where he is, he was absolutely point, on the point, you know, and maybe ahead of what he even thought himself. So with that, I just want to start my presentation. <coughs> so this is a leadership in NGO in healthcare, as you just uh, elucidated in your slide before. So the definition of health, as per the World Health Organization, WHO definition, is about the physical, mental and social well It's a holistic picture. Health is not about treating treatment of disease or infirmity. Health is about the holistic structure of how you think, how you live, and whether you are free from disease. So, so leaders in healthcare sectors, they have extraordinary challenges, as we all know, both at the personal and at the, at the organizational level. They, we have limited resources to work with because we are not given everything to work with. Uh, we work in volatile political and economic circumstances and we try our best to address the marginalized people of our society because as we know in India 80% uh, lives in rural areas and 20% lives in urban areas and the medicals 80% they serve the 20% of the urban areas and the 20% serve the 80% of the rural areas so it's a reverse scenario completely so the role of an NGO leader obviously it ensures that the organizations comply with all the laws, policies and expectations and for the most part to have a positive impact on the society and be agents for change. That's the very, very important line, the agent for change. Well, if you don't change what you are, where we are, things will not improve or things will not move at all. <coughs> so, in India, we spent about 1.2% of our GDP on public health care, which is actually abysmally low. It's one of the lowest in the world actually. So, and the overall expenditure on health is about 5% of the GDP where actually the Asian average is 6.3. The number of physicians is 0.72 per thousand, where the WHO mentions it's about 1.2. One doctor per 1,674 <coughs> citizens in India. The stipulation is one is to 1,000. <coughs> and we have 4.3. 5 lakh doctors available in India and we need another double the amount by 2020. So we need a change, our health, how our health system functions, what would bring the change and who would bring the change. Obviously in any developed countries we will think about the government of the time to bring about the change. It is not the duty of the citizens or private citizens to bring about changes in things like education, things like health system. But in India, things are looked differently and thank God for that. So this is, the power of a leader is not in the asset or bank balance, it is in the number of talented, passionate people who are willing to follow the leader to build an institution. So it is not about the salary, it's actually, it's, have you heard about the Pied Piper of Hamlin? Yeah, the story? I don't know whether many people... Five, five for a family. Yeah. 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 So this man actually led all these... Uh, rats. <laughs> rats. <laughs> so if, if it's not a perfect analogy, but Dr. Shetty, when he speaks, he hypnotizes people. With his power, with his passion, with his feeling, and with his truthfulness and honesty. That's what he is. So as we mentioned, it is affordable quality healthcare for the masses, that's what his vision was and 
as you rightly mentioned, 89, Dr. Shetty started the BM Builder, then 2000, the Rabindranath Tagore International Institute of Cardiac Sciences was promoted, and 2001, the NH started. I am just going to go through uh, the Dr. Shetty's slides a little quickly. He was Mother Teresa's uh, physician for a quite a period of time, uh, and uh, she had a true gift being able to bring a smile to a lot of people, and we were all involved in those days. 80% of the healthcare expenses, which was not mentioned, was actually out-of-pocket expenses in India. And that's a tremendous amount of burden for the society. And every year, every year in India, because of the out-of-pocket expenses, people sell their lands, people sell their belongings to actually get treated. And that creates about 50 million people to go below the poverty line every year because of the out-of-pocket expenses. And that's a very significant thing. The main challenge was to keep the quality of healthcare good with low cost, which you mentioned about Dr. Kiran Shamajumda, who is the founder of Biocon. So they tied up with Biocon for the generic medicines. That was one of the way, actually, the cost of the medicine, because that is one of the important uh, financial variable in a medical institution, the medicines. If the cost comes down and the quality is maintained, then actually you can, you're, you're ahead of time. So the medical treatment of the highest quality should be available even to those who could not afford it. That was a very, very important thing what Dr. Shetty believed. That people who could not afford, the money should not be the reason why people should not get treatment. That is very, very important. If you are not eligible for a surgery, that should be because of non-financial reasons. That you are not good enough or you know, you, 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 your other problems, you have got other problems, you cannot get the surgery. But for financial reasons, that you will not have the surgery, that was not acceptable to him. So that was one of the very, very important areas which he thought was to be addressed. Therefore, the cost of the surgery had to come down. So as you mentioned in your presentation, that how it was done, subsidized patients with lesser pain capacity. And who paid for that? We had a private way. So it was kind of a, like a Robin Hood medicine. So people who could pay, they paid the money for people who could not pay. So even today, 40% of our patients actually pay for probably 60% of the surgeries, all the treatment is done in NH. So high volumes to lower cost. More you increase the volumes, the cost comes down. Now in our hospitals, in particular in the NH I'm talking about, we do not have much of the cables of the rooms. It is more of partitions with screens, which means it's a ward where you can see all the patients, which means that your deployment of nurses, the number of nurses you require to see a patient comes down. Because if a nurse sits in a cubicle here or a station here and all the patients are visible, you can do with four or five nurses <coughs> compared to say if you had 50 rooms, you required at least 75 to 80 nurses. This is one of the ways he actually brought it down. So this was the wall modulation of the healthcare which you mentioned and these are the ways the volumes were increased without uh, compounding on the quality, without going down on the quality because we devised plans whereby all the patients remained in a dormitory rather than single rooms. And the machines again were on a monthly rate. So NH hardly bought any machines from anybody. And we were very, very uh, strong in that area. We always rented the machines. As a company, you park your machine, we we'll leave your consumables, and you take your machines once it's outdated, and it's your headache to make sure that the machines are actually parked in our hospital. And the maintenance of the machine is also done by the company itself. Whether it's in the interest of the company that the machines work so that your consumables are used. Because the machine doesn't cost much. The work, for the company, what happens is the consumables are the important thing which is used. This is about the Rabindranath Tagore International Institute and I am talking about my journey now. So, my mentor, obviously Dr. Devi Shetty and inspiration, the same Mother Teresa. So, we, we had something in common when we started off. This, this is your picture with her, right? Yes. yes. Way back in 
So I was one of the founder members of the Ramdana Tagore International Institute of Cardiac Sciences in 2000. And uh, the other thing which did not come, come in a presentation was that we performed a lot of health camps, a lot of it. And we went to all the districts of Bengal and we performed health camps, free health camps. And then had cardiac camps, we had other special multi-speciality camps and we did it on a regular basis and till date we do close to 300 health camps a year on a regular basis. So that is one of the ways we reach out to people because I believe that time has come when the medical facility has to go to the doorsteps of the people rather than the patients coming to the hospital on a regular basis. Let us go to them, find out if they require hospitalization and let them come to us. In that way, there are two advantages. One is to uh, reduce the number of patients in the hospital, crowding them here unnecessarily. And secondly, I think it conveniences them because if we go to them. So, started the concept of health cards for underprivileged groups in the urban settings. We started this uh, concept that we provide health cards, health cards to the underprivileged sections of the society. Who are they? This is one of the uh, societies in this uh, city. This is the Film Institute because we have a very strong presence of Film Institute in the city. And these are the technicians who work. We have about 20,000 technicians in this city who work in the Film Institutes and they have very low salary, no insurance covered, nothing of that sort. So we provide them health cards and we give a lot of privileges to them and the insurance premium is paid by their association now. So it's a compact uh, organization we have now and these, pay, these people who become patients, they actually come on a regular basis. So they have benefited. Now we have increased their cover to the spouses and the dependents. So this is one of the areas. And this is uh, Eden Gardens of Calcutta. I think a lot of people who are Indians who know that as a cricket fans. So they have groundsmen. This Cricket Association of Bengal is one of the uh, richest cricketing body in India. But they had insurances for all their staff except the groundsmen. The people who actually make the game, people who actually make the ground, they did not have insurance coverage at all. So what we did, we went there and we gave health cards to them as well. We do regular health camps with them and gave health, health cards to them. This was about under, uh, urban underprivileged. So the next step obviously was focusing on the rural health and the rural reluctance. What is the reluctance? The National Rural Health Mission Report says that over 700 million people lives in so many villages, Indian villages and 66% do not have access to critical medicines and 31% of this population travels for more than 30 kilometers to seek health care and that is abysmal. So what was the solution to it? So what I thought was the e-health which Dr. Shetty had already propagated. But Dr. Shetty's uh, e-health programs were limited to tier 2 and tier 3 cities of India. It had not gone as far as the rural landscape of India. So what I did was, I made sure that the foundation which we created, we went to the rural areas. And today in rural areas, in rural India, we do not have need to eat, but we have the connectivity there. We have at least 3G connectivity in Indian rural areas. So e-health was not an issue there because we had good connectivity and we had the resources to do it. So we thought about it. And the spoke and the hub model, where actually the hub is the Rabindar Tagore and the spokes were the different villages of India. And we wanted different international agencies, NGOs and others to need to pool in resources and go hard on the awareness drive, keeping the socio-cultural issues in mind. Because we have to be very careful about talking to the rural people, because we have to be sensitive to their social issues and the cultural issues when we're talking to them. So the rural lift was the foundation which I created, which is called the Moinapur Rural Healthcare Foundation. Moinapur is the name of the village from where this whole foundation started. It's a village about 50 kilometers from uh, Bakura, which is a, a district, and 
137 kilometers from the state capital of Calcutta. So this is where uh, two of our colleagues will be traveling, I think in 20th of October, to do a camp. And as per the population census in 2011, 19,853 people live in Moynapur, which is not a big deal. But what happened was, when we started Moynapur, the whole of Bakura district could actually get access. And when we started there, the Bakura district had access. And today, seven years down, five years down the line, we have access to at least 10 million people. And that's an amazing thing because people come to know about it and people throng to these camps. So we have one medical college, one district hospital, uh, one five rural hospitals, 17 primary health centers. And these are some of the pictures. It's a very, very remote place. And uh, this is, you can see the roads <coughs> there which do not have much access. And the nearest hospital is about 60 kilometers away. The primary health center is about 20 kilometers away. They did not have any ambulance facilities, no registered medical practitioners. And ours was the first heart camp which we did in 2014. So our objectives were two. One was the medical objective, second was the educational. Because without educating people, this, you cannot go very far. You cannot penetrate any society without making them aware or educating them. So two objectives were there, medical and educational. So the visions were facilitating the delivery of right to healthcare facilities for individuals of Mayanapur and adjoining villages. We started with Mayanapur, now the whole area has come into it. And holding the hands of the underprivileged and meritorious students and mentoring them, that was the educational vision which, we, which I had. So, the objectives are the reaching to the economically underprivileged rural patients need to diagnose treatable medical problems in the children and adults and the rural and urban connect and follow up the treated patients. So, these were the medical objectives which we had. So, we had the patients in the rural areas, we could diagnose, that is very, very important because we could only diagnose and we could not go any further. And, but, as, as everybody knows, without diagnosing, cannot treat. If, if you have a problem, we need to know what is it first. Then only we can go for the treatment. So instead of these people coming to us, to, to the city's hospitals which they could not afford, they could not come and there were a lot of social barriers, cultural barriers, what we tried to do is reach to them. And that was one of the important objectives of MRHF. And the Rural Urban Connect and the follow-up of treated patients through the e-health program which I'm going to come later. So we had health camps, we had 24-7 <coughs> communication lines open. So my mobile, my WhatsApp was actually open to anybody in the village and they could c communicate with me 24-7. So that is a very, very important thing in medical profession that your mobile is not switched off when you require me. That is a very important thing. So we do about 8 multi-speciality camps per year. 150 patients on an average, the venue is the primary school there and ECGs are done, bloods are done, x-rays are done and consultations are done. And the uh, word of mouth propagation of the scans are done and also through some pamphlets and television channels, cable TV. So these are some of the pictures of the camps and these are the venue and on, your, on, your, on that side you see uh, the health awareness talks taking place before the camp and these are the members of the foundation and they are mostly from that village uh, except a few who are from the hospital and this is the general body meeting which you have uh, at the end of the camp in the evening. So this is something which we have on a regular basis. And this school, by the way, where we do our camp, was established in 1868. So it's a very, very old school there. And the village is actually pretty old. And these are my colleagues from the NH who attends there on a regular basis. And we're seeing patients there. So the e-health concept in Moynapur was in, was in collaboration with Narayana <coughs> And we had coordinators on both ends, I was on this end and we had a coordinator on the other end 
and who is a rural health practitioner who is screen the patients and bring them there. We had a broadband connection and we saw about 100 patients per month. So this is how it is operating. I am sitting in my chamber in Ravinar Tagore and these are the people on the other end in Moinapur. It is about 137 kilometers and do it on a regular basis. So we are connected with them. It is not just a one-off camp and we forget them. So it is a total connection with them. And then what happened was when we gave an ECG machine to them, this is how the whole thing changed and this was beyond my imagination as well. So what, what triggered this decision was that people used to have chest pain there. People have chest pain everywhere in the world. So what do you do when you have chest pain? Even in Calcutta when you have chest pain, first thing you do is actually call your GP who comes in, does the ECG. Maybe the ECG cannot be read by him because he's not qualified to read it. So he goes to a hospital and then the ECG is read there. And that takes about two to three hours where you lose the golden time if you have a heart attack. So what happened was that I gave an ECG to the machine to them and then this is the chest and triage in Moinapur. The rural health practitioner is informed the ECG is done in 20 minutes. Then the ECG is transmitted to me via WhatsApp. <coughs> the diagnosis is made within 30 minutes. So that is the vital thing. And as I mentioned here, and this is a 24-7 service, and if somebody has got a heart attack, they are transported to the primary health center. And the time taken for the index the diagnosis nearly matches the price tag in Singapore, which is the best in the world, which takes 20 minutes. So in a village like Mayanapur, the chest pain to the diagnosis takes 30 minutes. And that's something which is, an, which which has a model we can replicate everywhere. So what they have in the ECG machine, I have trained the locals, who, do, who does the ECG? I have trained the local boys actually, who have no degree, nothing. They are not, not in class 10 educators. They do the ECGs. And by trial and error, now they have perfected the art of doing ECGs. And about 7 or 8 of them actually know how to do ECGs. So they are the stars of the village today. With any chest pain, they run through the ECG machine, do the ECG, immediately take a snap, send it to me through WhatsApp, and immediately I talk to the rural heart practitioner, and immediately uh, some action is taken. So about 876 plus ECGs were done in the last three years, 75 heart attacks were transferred to primary health centers, and five died on the way to the hospital. Now you might think only 75, but the important thing is that 801 patients could sleep with certainty that they did not have a heart problem. That is the most important thing. When you have chest pain, what is more important is diagnosis of the problem rather than how you treat it. And about 70 to 80 percent of the chest pains actually is not a heart problem. So to negate something, to say that you do not have a heart problem is as important as treating somebody with a heart attack. So the problem, the rural urban gap is about 26% of doctors as I mentioned serves 72% of the population and the manpower is inadequate. So this was one of the ways how we could improve on uh, <coughs> delivering the healthcare there. So the possible solution was that homegrown products will hopefully serve their own. Why do, why do people from the uh, uh, cities, they don't want to go to the villages because of inadequate facilities there school problems, there are hundreds of reasons why people don't go from the uh, cities to the village to serve as doctors. So my thought is that if you could pick up doctors from their own community, then there is a chance that, and there is a possibility, there is no guarantee, there is a possibility that those boys and girls will actually go back and serve them. So I thought to catch them young, we have to catch them at school. And medics and paramedics are equally important. It's not about doctors, it's about health professionals who are required to serve the community. Doctor is only a part. You have nurses, you have technicians, you have physiotherapists, you have ECG technicians, you have lab technicians and what not. So the whole entire spectrum is actually required when you are treating somebody. So we have a scholarship program in place in, in, in this foundation and every year we give a one-off scholarship to the best student of the 16 adjoining village school. So that is one program which we have started. 
and most importantly, we have Udaya Pathe. Udaya Pathe is actually one of the programs uh, which is Dr. Devi Shetty's uh, brainchild, where young, meritorious, underprivileged students actually are given uh, scholarships from two years if they are from class 10 to class 12, and for five years if they have uh, been eligible to study medicine. And once they finish their courses, they are guaranteed a job in our hospital. So, with this uh, in mind, we have started the Udaya Pathe program and we have enrolled quite a few number of students from the village uh, scenarios because I prefer that the rural students get preference over the city students because I want that these scholarship programs should benefit the rural people more than the city people. So, there's the question. That's it amongst all the students and we have this on the 6th of October actually. Um, this program. Every year we have this program and we select out of a huge pool of students who apply and this is a very very difficult time when we do the selection because all seems to be eligible because they come from really really underprivileged backgrounds. So these are the students, these are the people who have already become doctors from those programs. These are the students, she is a doctor, these, these are doctors, and these are the students who are actually uh, about to become doctors. So this is a very successful program which is running for the last 13 years. <coughs> and Mayanapur Rural Healthcare Foundation has joined hands with them for the last four years. So these are some of the articles which is published in the media for the media presence. These are the television programs which I do where I mentioned about the Mayanapur Rural Healthcare Foundation. So I got some space in the television to talk about this model and these are our journals which we have published every year uh, 2015, 16, 17, 18. So these are the journals where I encourage the villages to give their articles so that they can read something. So it's, it's giving dignity to them, you know, that's very, very important. We can't give a lot of things to them but what we can give through these journals is actually that they are writing in a proper journal which is going to so many people. So that they feel very good about it, very proud about it. This is our website which you have, you can note it down and everything is done, given on that website www.mrhf.in and it is a pretty comprehensive website but I would encourage you if you have any suggestions, there is a blog there which you can write in that blog and tell us how to improve the website. And these are some of the people we have uh, who support this program. This man I think a lot of people know. Saurav Ganguly is one of our uh, icons of Bengal and the rest are famous writers. This gentleman is actually head of the department of cardiology in Singapore and I, would, I used to work with him. So he is one of the supporters of this model. So the structure and functionality of this MRHF is Chief Patron, Board of Trustees, Executive Body Members, General Body Members, Invited Members, Local Volunteers and it's an autonomous non-government health educational and sports based activity, health camps, e-health and scholarship programs, self-funded, we have donation sum from the individuals and the CSR funding from the multinational companies who help us on ECGs, bloods, x-rays and what not and we link with Narayana Health, with Manpower to run the health camps and the Udayapathe program. We have some little programs in this in the government sector where the children under the age of 18, they are actually given free treatment and referred to government secondary and tertiary care programs. New add-ons have been, uh, we have moved on from Mainapur to different uh, locations in uh, West Bengal and also in the neighboring state and we have seen more than 1500 patients last year. So what it, what was uh, MRHS before was single specialty, <laughs> single location. Now it has moved to multi-speciality, multiple locations, e-health, 24-7 chest pain trials and scholarship program. The limitations was that we have only diagnostic capability. We did not have the fund to actually send these patients for treatment. We used to scout front, we used to get people into the government hospitals but there also there is there are some limitations in terms of treatment in terms of the fundings 
and this is only a model. This is not something which is replicated elsewhere. So this this is the limitation of this foundation. So Ayushman Bharat actually is a program which started 